Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast on advancing digital pathology with Cytoviva's hyperspectral microscopy. I'm Carol Ray, the program manager at Cytoviva and moderator for today's event. I'll go ahead and start the introductions while we wait for others to join. Um, Cytoviva is a scientific imaging and instrumentation company that develops and markets optical microscopy and hyperspectral imaging technology for nanomaterials, pathogen, and general biology applications. Today, you will hear from Byron Cheatham, Vice President of Cytoviva, and Dr. Jim Beach, Director of Technology Development. They will provide an overview of the principles of Cytoviva's enhanced dark field optics and optical spectral imaging. Byron is a longtime technology development entrepreneur who's led the market implementation of Cytoviva's optical and hyperspectral imaging technologies since the company's inception in 2005. During this time, he has overseen the successful implementation of Cytoviva systems into hundreds of researchers' labs worldwide. Dr. Beach brings over 18 years of experience in imaging systems to direct Cytoviva's hyperspectral systems development program. Dr. Beach, who joined Cytoviva in 2008, led the initial development and deployment of Cytoviva's first hyperspectral imaging product offering. As Director of Technology Development, Dr. Beach leads the effort to create new imaging and analysis capabilities for the Cytoviva product line. At this time, I will now hand the webinar over to Byron and Jim. Um, please also note that um, we will have some Q&A at the end of this webinar, um, and you can post questions by using the chat box below. So thank you. Thank you very much, Carol. And we appreciate uh, uh, everyone's attendance today as we talk about hyperspectral microscopy and its utility, growing utility uh, in the digital pathology world, both uh, from a, a basic and applied research perspective. But also we'll touch a little bit on uh, some of the developing clinical opportunities that are happening with uh, hyperspectral microscopy uh, in, in the world of digital pathology. So with that, I will uh, see if we can get uh, going with the webinar. And I, I wanna give you a, a quick overview. Uh, again, my name is Byron Cheetah, as, as Carol mentioned, and I'm vice president uh, at, at Cytoviva. Before we get started, and my colleague, uh, Jim Beach is director of technology development at Cytoviva. And today I'm gonna to give you an overview of, of the company and, and together uh, with my lead, we'll, we'll go through the technology overview. And then we'll, we'll focus in on a couple of pathology applications. On a cursory level, we're gonna look at some cancerous tissue uh, related applications, as well as looking at bisphenol A uh, in uh, some tissue. And then uh, Dr. Beach is gonna drill down uh, at, at a very granular level with a, with a live pathology application that's related to preamyloidal proteins that were identified in ex vivo tissue. So as the, as the webinar is going on, if you have questions, please go ahead and, and you can type those questions in the, uh, in the, uh, the Zoom box. Uh, Carol will be taking note of those. And then after the, the webinar is over, we will, uh, we will go through and, and review each of those questions and, and answer them to the best of our ability. If we can't answer them on the spot, we have the ability to, to get back in touch with you later on a one-on-one -on -one basis if more, uh, if more is needed. We want to start by giving you guys uh, just a little overview of Cytoviva, the company, and, and, and what its purpose is. Cytoviva was formed uh, approximately 18 years ago based on some microscope optics that were developed at Auburn University we're based in the Auburn uh, University Research Park, which is in the southeast of the, of the US, uh, outside of Atlanta, about, uh, about uh, 90 uh, miles, uh, but uh, so in the southeast. The side of even technology that we're gonna talk about today is utilized on a ubiquitous basis worldwide in laboratories all over the world. And while side of Eva itself is, is a fairly small company we uh, leverage development partners around the world uh, to develop our technology, but we also leverage distribution partners around the world uh, in places such as uh, Europe and, and Asia, Australia, 
and manage distribution in the US directly ourselves since we're based here. Now, this slide is designed just to give you an overview of the types of research institutes, and, and this is focused primarily on research institutes here in North America that have acquired the technology and the type of work they're doing with them. One of the things that, that uh, these enhanced dark field microscope optics that we're gonna talk about today uh, do, they, they're, they're, they're very keen as it relates to allowing a researcher to even observe at the nanoscale, scatter at the nanoscale. And so we do a lot of work uh, at the nano bio interface, nano drug delivery, uh, or nanomaterials that are being developed for biosensors, or even where nanomaterials are being studied for their potential toxicity. And so you see a lot of that there. But most of the pathology application work that we're doing is fairly new because the idea of looking at uh, either in stained tissue or unstained tissue and measuring either the stain spectrum or the endogenous tissue spectrum is a fairly new development. But the, the, uh, the applications and the institutes that you see circled and in green are example applications and example institutes that have acquired the technology for pathology related applications. And in fact, the, the, uh, the application at the University of Minnesota regarding Alzheimer's diagnostic is the one that, that uh, my colleague Jim is, is going to spend a good bit of time on today. He has been actively involved in that process uh, from, from the beginning. And also the pancreatic cancer detection application is one that we're gonna cover a little bit from an application perspective. We're not gonna go through these example publications, but we want you to just get a sense that the technology is already being utilized for pathology related applications. And this is just a small sampling of some of the uh, uh, peer review publications uh, that are out there uh, that reference this technology uh, in great detail, uh, some of which are, are methods uh, uh, papers, method application papers, where our technology and, and its use in pathology was the, uh, was the principal focus of the paper. Again, not going to go through these, but just want to, uh, to sort of validate uh, from a scientific perspective how, how this technology is, is being used and, and, and being published. And with that, we're going to transition really quickly into um, how this technology is utilized uh, on more of a ubiquitous basis. We're going to focus today with the microscope uh, on, on two modalities. Uh, first is, is traditional bright build, and we're actually going to show an example in traditional bright build microscopy of work that can be done with, with h and &E samples, which are traditionally imaged in that mode. Now, we understand that most of the uh, people on the call today, especially if you have a pathology background, of course, you're intimately familiar with bright field microscopy and how it works. So a lot of our focus on the microscope side is going to be on the enhanced dark field optics that uh, were developed and patented and, and licensed by our company, combining that with hyperspectral uh, imaging on the microscope. And so first, we want you to understand what hyperspectral microscopy enables you to do and we're going to talk about that in the context of, uh, of the dark field related image here. Again, we're going to show you some, some data in bright field as well. And first thing we're going to show you is a dark field image. And these are macrophages that internalized nanoscale low density, lipo, uh, low density uh, lipids uh, that could be utilized as a drug delivery vector. And so what we want you to see is in dark field, you can see the macrophage and you can see the structure there. These little uh, punctate uh, uh, things that you see inside the macrophage are actually the nano low density lipids uh, that are there, lipoproteins. And what we want you to understand is, is that the macrophage itself is producing some interesting uh, optical spectrum that we can measure at the pixel level. And the low density uh, lipoproteins are also producing unique optical spectrum that we're measuring as well. And so we can actually, uh, measure these, uh, these spectral response characteristics of these two entities in the sample image at the pixel level. And in this image size at, with a 60X magnification, pixels are going to be approximately 200, 250 nanometers in size. And we measure the optical spectrum in each one of those 200 to 250 nanometer 
spatial areas across the entire image, okay? And so you can see the, the image in the hyperspectral mode, and it looks almost identical to what you see in the eyepiece of the microscope. And then you have the ability to capture and measure the spectral response. And if that spectral response is in every pixel, you can use powerful hyperspectral image analysis software to identify the unique sample characteristics and conduct a wide range of spectral analysis capabilities, some of which we're going to show you here as we go. But we wanted to just use this slide to give you a, a real basic overview of, of, of what it does. And with that, we're going to transition into the technology overview. And we want to start by just showing you uh, what a, a typical image setup looks like, a, a footprint of the, of the image. And if you're a pathologist, you're going to have some comfort because the first thing you see is a basic re upright research grade optical microscope. Uh, many of you recognize this is an Olympus microscope. You can see the Olympus brand there. And uh, we have the ability to provide and most typically do provide a system, a turnkey system from the light source all the way to the image capture and image analysis software with all the hardware components in between. We have the ability to operate in traditional transmitted bright field and transmitted dark field. We can also work in reflected bright field and dark field from the top down. Traditional fluorescence microscopy, whether it's epifluorescence and there's some other techniques can be utilized with hyperspectral microscopy. And we can capture hyperspectral images in the visual near infrared from 400 to 1,000 nanometers or in the shortwave infrared from 900 to 1,700 nanometers on this system. So this is just to give you an overview. Now, one of the, one of the key elements that we want to show you here is that there are different ways to capture hyperspectral images. We utilize a technology that's referred to as line scanning or push broom. And we, we decided on line scan and push broom for, for a number of reasons. But I think, Jim, and you, you were the developer here, and you, you, can, you can opine on this, but line scan seems to produce the best overall spectral resolution across the widest wavelengths. Would you agree, or is that, was that your basis? I, I, would, I would agree with that. The, if, you, if you go with a very high quality, high resolution spectrograph, um, you're, you're basically going to get a very good resolution in the spectrum across all the wavelengths. You really want that, I, I think, you really want that for this type of work. Um, and what that works on is a line of the uh, field of view at a time. The spectrograph can analyze from one line at a time. Therefore, um, if you do push broom, which is basically taking the full slide area and, and moving it incrementally while you take uh, line spectrum after line spectrum, um, you achieve high spatial and spectral resolution together. You, you, you may take a little bit longer time to do it. You're going to require a fixed specimen, um, but the results then are, um, you know, a good, good quality optical image and a high resolution spectral data point in each case. That's, that's how I see this. Okay, thank you, thank you. And, and it's important to note that from a microscopy perspective, in addition to, to bright build or dark build or fluorescence, is that you can capture these images at any, at any magnification that you want from 10X to 100X. I know 40X for pathologists is sort of the, the sweet spot uh, in, in most you know, uh, application work that, that, that they're involved in. So 40X is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is an option as well as in, 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 any, uh, yes. in any magnification. And, and let, me, let me add to that. that there was some um, some engineering and algorithm development necessary to allow you to do this push broom at any magnification and still retain a, a, a square geometry in the image that comes out. So that's part of what we put into the system. Awesome, awesome. So as I mentioned, I, because we know that this is a pathology related uh, uh, focus and that many of the uh, attendees here uh, have a pathology background and, and a good understanding of bright field microscopy. We're not going to bore you with bright field microscopy and how it works, but we do want to spend some time 
on site of this patented enhanced dark field microscope optics because they can provide some major advantages when you're doing hyperspectral microscopy, especially in what we're going to call a label-free environment where you're looking at the optical spectrum based on the endogenous scatter of the samples that you might be looking at, okay? And, and we, we want to start by, by just looking at how dark field works in general. And so dark field works in general by taking light and, and, and moving the light at a very shallow or oblique angle toward the sample such that the source light bypasses the objective's uh, intake, but scatter from the sample goes into the objective. And that is the, that is the basis by which dark field uh, microscopy works. And so it's designed to, to reduce the noise from the source light as the angle of the source light is, is greater than the angle of light acceptance by the objective's numerical aperture, okay? Again, that can work with multiple different, uh, uh, you know, uh, objectives and, and multiple different magnifications. And so that's that's how dark field works. Now, if you were to acquire dark field from any microscope company, they're going to provide you dark field in a super efficient manner. And it's going to work similar to bright field in that light goes through uh, from the back of the microscope through the base of the microscope where you have uh, field lenses and, and, and collector lenses. Typically, they're plastic. Uh, and there's a lot of light loss that occurs here. Then as the light uh, exits the field diaphragm, it has to travel through about nine to 10 centimeters of air, uh, which is horrible if you're trying to actually manage the light in a really precise manner. Now in bright field, it really doesn't matter because you're throwing so many photons perpendicular to the, to the sample that that process doesn't really matter in bright field. But in dark field, it matters a lot. And it also makes it really difficult to, uh, to be able to conduct proper color illumination and critical illumination. Color illumination meaning to focus the source light onto the condenser and critical illumination meaning to focus the light properly onto the sample. Those are tricky things to do in dark field. They're pretty simple in bright field. And this process does not allow effective use uh, of the light in dark field. So the development team at Auburn University that developed this enhanced dark field capability understood that if they could manage the light very precisely from the source illumination to the dark field condenser, that they could, they could perfect color illumination of dark field to the condenser and then allow perfected critical illumination to the sample, focus the light very precisely on the sample, such that you could improve the signal to noise ratio in dark field, uh, improve the scattering efficiency and decrease the amount of noise from the source light. And this is the process by which this works. This entire system sits in the condenser mount and because the color illumination is managed from an engineering perspective internally to the system, it's perfected every time. You don't even have to achieve color illumination by moving the condenser up and down like you would bright field or like you would do with typical dark field. But because it's internalized, you can move this entire system up and down on the z-axis to get this very shallow oblique angle uh, uh, cone of light onto the exact focal plane that you want of the sample that's on the slide. So you can optimize the, the focus of this shallow oblique angle illumination onto the sample in such a way that you get really good scatter efficiency, you get really low background noise, and it allows you to be able to observe nanoscale elements very simply, very easily, in a highly repeatable manner. And so as you're working with non-stained or non-fluorescent related images, this can become really important. Here's an example of, of, of how that can manifest itself. And, and uh, if you look at conventional dark field images, these are, uh, these are uh, nanoparticles. These are 160 nanometer uh, iron oxide nanoparticles. And this is using conventional dark field. And this is what the image looks like. Using Cytoviva's enhanced dark field optics, you see an increase in the signal, a decrease in the noise. Signal to noise ratio measured by this group that published this paper showed um, 
that it averaged about a 10% increase in signal to noise. Tenfold. Tenfold, yes. Using side of Eva's enhanced dark field optics versus off the shelf dark field optics uh, from the microscope company in this case. And so this can be very important as you're trying to measure. Jim's going to actually show you an, an, the example of the preamyloidal proteins. This was super important when you're trying to look at the optical spectral signal of these preamyloidal proteins in, in, uh, in dense tissue, for example, that we're going to look at here in just a second. Now we're going to transition on and, and just talk about hyperspectral imaging a little bit. And, and we've already talked about this, uh, but we talked about the fact that you can capture hyperspectral images in the visible near infrared range or the shortwave infrared range. I would say that the overwhelming majority of the work that we do is in the visual near infrared range, which operates from 400 to 1,000 nanometers. You can work with the SWIR hyperspectral image from 900 to 1,700. Both systems can actually be equipped on the microscope using a dual port camera mount, okay? That dual port camera mount can also be used to have a hyperspectral system on the microscope and to have your optical camera on the microscope as well. So um, if you want to capture optical images in addition to hyperspectral images, that's possible with the system. Now in the Wiener range, pixels can be as small as 128 nanometers and, and, and the, si the actual size of the pixels and the pixel resolution, of course, varies based on the uh, detector that's integrated onto the diffraction grading spectrograph that's being utilized. And we utilize different detectors uh, for different applications. Some can be CCD, some can be as CMOS cameras, some can be uh, EM CCD cameras for ultra sensitivity if, if it's required. And all of those are going to have different pixel sizes and different pixel resolution. Okay. Uh, but, but we can work with a number one, number of those different uh, uh, systems. And of course, we're working with an in-gas system if we're working in the shortwave infrared range. Now, in the visible near-infrared range, we can get very high spectral resolution. We're not talking about spatial resolution here. We're talking about spectral resolution down to about two nanometers. But the coolest part about hyperspectral imaging is, is all of this data in every pixel is in an RGB, is in a, is in a, is in a colored image. It looks almost identical to what you see in the eyepiece, okay? And so you get all the spectral data in spatial context, and you can do the detailed quantitative analysis that, that, we, that we talked about. And Jim talked about the line scan process already. This is just a, 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 an image that's representing uh, how this works. Any, any commentary on, on this process or pretty, pretty clear, I guess. I think it's clear that the red arrow that we can see uh, cursor here, now the stage is going to move according to this direction. As it moves, uh, it comes across the new line of, of the specimen. The stage stops at that point. Our algorithm causes the stage to stop and be stable. That way we can get no, uh, no motion blur. We get a, a good stable spectral image across that line. Record it. Wait for the recording to the end. Start the stage again. And this repeats. It doesn't really add a lot of time to, to the, uh, complete the scan. And it's superior, I think, to the other methods that we've seen out there where the uh, stage is moving at a constant velocity while the image is being recorded at the same time. That's it. Uh, the, the slide is under the microscope objective. It moves, uh, oh, you know, several tens to 100 microns per step, stops, takes an image, and, and then repeats. Very good. And we use a very high resolution, uh, step resolution stage for this process. And, uh, and, and you know, there are a number of challenges that you have to overcome to be able to, to build this capability. You have to put the right hardware together. You have to integrate it with the right software. Uh, and that's what Jim's done over the years in, in the development of this technology is ensure that for different applications that we integrate the, the right hardware, whether it's camera hardware, spectrograph hardware, microscope or stage hardware, together with image capture and analysis software, which helps us to be able to produce the, uh, the uh, data results that, that uh, end users are looking for. And to that point, we're going to transition now away 
from uh, talking about the technology. We'll come back to that if you've got questions and answer any questions that you've got about the technology or how the technology translates to different examples. One thing I will mention that we're not talking about here, we focus on hyperspectral microscopy. There is the ability to do hyperspectral imaging, not at the submicron level, but at the multi-micron level as well. Uh, from a pixel size perspective. And we can do what we call macro hyperspectral imaging as well on, on bigger samples. We're not gonna go into that today, but just as a side note, that's, that's a capability that we have. I'm gonna cover a couple of pathology applications really quickly, and then turn it over to Jim to really do a deep dive on the amyloid protein uh, related application that, that he was involved in with the University of Minnesota. And we're gonna start by looking at unstained cancerous tissue where we utilize the enhanced dark field hyperspectral imaging. And here in this application example, we have two hyperspectral images, one of controlled pancreatic cancer tissue and the other of stage one pancreatic cancer tissue, uh, controlled healthy pancreatic tissue here on the left, cancerous on the right. Now, to the pathologist or even to the casual observer, you can tell that there's differences in the morphology and just differences in the way that these two samples look. And, and we, we, we're showing this on purpose, right? Because it, it's, it's intuitively obvious that they're different. There's, there's obviously there's changes in, in, the, uh, in, in the morphology of this that changes in the way they look driven by uh, cell necrosis and, and, and other things related to this. These are hyperspectral images. This is almost identical to what an unstained dark field tissue sample would look like in the microscope. And again, we captured this at 40X uh, uh, objective, which is uh, typical of, of, of what you would be doing from a uh, pathology perspective. What I'm showing you here is a mean optical spectrum. Mean meaning it's, it's, it's an optical spectrum from probably many hundreds of pixels of the cancerous tissue in red and the control tissue in white. Okay, and so this is spectrum that has been normalized. It's been lamp normalized as a term we use, but in fact, it's not lamp normalized. You're, you're normalizing against the lamp structure. But what you're really doing is you're really trying to normalize for differences in the spectrum related to the instrument response. Okay, and, and so also both of these mean spectrum example spectrum, mean spectrum, have been normalized to an intensity factor of one so that we can just do a comparative analysis of them uh, differently. And you see that we have data from 400 nanometers all the way to 1,000 nanometers here um, in the visible near-infrared range, okay? Now, here is a, a large blown-up image of, of the control tissue that we're looking at. And here is uh, the pancreatic uh, tissue. Uh, stage uh, cancer tissue that we're looking at here. Now, in this next example, we have uh, conducted spectral mapping, and the spectral mapping is designed to map every pixel in this image that has significant unique spectral differences in the spectrum from any spectrum recorded in the negative control tissue. And we're doing this to just demonstrate how that the system can identify spectral differences between unstained control uh, uh, pancreatic cancer tissue versus control tissue, okay? And in this image, we're showing the actual spectral library that was utilized for the spectral mapping. Now, these are individual single pixel spectra. They look a little noisy maybe, and, and, and that's as a result of, of them being very small pixel related uh, spectral data. Now, none of this uh, spectrum would map in the negative control tissue. Uh, there's, there's actually a, a, an algorithm uh, that the development team built called Filter Spectral Library, which allows us to build a large spectral library from the, uh, from the positive tissue, the cancer tissue, and then be able to filter that against every pixel of the control tissue. And that can be done with numerous samples, numerous times to create a, a spectral library, in this case, of stage one pancreatic cancer in a stain-free environment where we have a 99% plus uh, confidence that it, it will not give us any false positives, 
okay, when we conduct the spectral mapping. And then the spectral mapping can actually produce some quantitative output data that will tell us across that sample what percent of the pixel areas in that sample maps for cancer, okay? So that's a, a, giving us a, a 2D area. It's not a volumetric uh, data set in X, Y, and Z, just a 2D area, but demonstrating the percentage of, 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 uh, of, of cancer uh, across that sample that we actually spectrally mapped. I'm going to, uh, to now uh, transition and, and show uh, on some, some tissue, an H and E stain tissue, a bright field application, because hyperspectral microscopy can have a uh, really nice utility in H and E stained environments as well, especially if, for example, the differences in the stain of the disease state versus healthy state or the, the chemistry in the, in the sample versus no chemistry in the sample is difficult for your eye to be able to detect. With two nanometers of spectral resolution, hyperspectral microscopy can show you things that are difficult for you to, to, to see yourself in a lot of cases. So here we're looking at a hyperspectral image in bright build. At, I, I think this was 40X as well. I, I, I don't remember for sure of H and E stain tissue. And here we're looking at tissue uh, of uh, a mouse that was exposed to uh, uh, bisphenol A. So that's the, the chemical uh, that's harmful, known harmful as a carcinogen uh, that's involved in plastics, okay? And so this was a toxicology research effort to try to understand where the BPA was taken up by the tissue of the mouse and try to compare that against uh, non-exposed mice uh, in a laboratory setting. And so here we're looking at the hyperspectral image of control H&E versus the BPA exposed H&E. The, the only variable difference is the BPH exposed. And we see that, that the, the H&E stain in this area, they produce two spectrum. The spectrum of the BPA is here in red and the negative control is in green. And we see what looks like just a really, you know, insignificant shift to the untrained eye, untrained from a spectral imaging perspective. So the peak uh, of the uh, of the BPA exposed is about uh, 700 uh, and and you know 40 nanometers. Uh, it looks like here, and then there's a, a blue shift of the control. You also see a, a shift, a blue shift of the of the control in this direction versus the red in this direction. So at two nanometers of spectral resolution, we can easily, the system from a, a computational perspective can easily uh, measure that and, 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 and demonstrate that in a, in a mapping algorithm type of way, even though your eyes can't see that difference. And so here, let's see, I'm going to show, this is a close up again of the BPA exposed and this is the area where the BPA exposed to seem to have the, the, the biggest impact on the tissue. And then this is the spectral mapping demonstrating where there is different spectrum in this tissue spectrally as a result of the presence of the BPA versus the negative control. And again, showing on a, on a, on a scale up basis, these spectral differences that we're measuring, uh, they're pretty significant in the system. So while, in the H and E stain mode, our eyes can't see the difference because it's nuanced. And a lot of these differences are getting over here uh, toward the, the near infrared range outside of the visible. There's, this is in the visible range and it's a little more nuanced. The spectral imager and the software can certainly detect those differences and demonstrate where they are in a highly quantitative way, okay? And so these are the two applications that we wanted to show of, of, of more tissue related uh, applications that are, that are uh, seen and done on, on a regular basis. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jim and, and Jim is gonna provide you with a, a pretty detailed review of, of, of an actual uh, long-term study that was conducted at the University of Minnesota that Jim has been very involved in. Yeah, I am Jim. All right, let's see. Well, actually, to get started with this, let's let's just look at this more from the spectroscopy point of view. Uh, what is a hyperspectrum in the first?
first place. And it begins with, with the lamp. What we're recording in hyperspectral imaging without a specimen in place is really just a recording of the halogen lamp spectrum. The halogen lamp spectrum, we got the cursor here, has a Gaussian shape. Actually, output from a halogen lamp doesn't. It, it continues to get stronger and stronger as you go to longer wavelengths. However, the, uh, the components in the visible near infrared system, uh, that is the camera, the spectrograph, light guide and things, um, curtail that and, and give us this much of it. It's a, got a Gaussian shape and it fills most of the 400 to nanometer range. 400 to 1,000 nanometer range here. Well, all right, that's that's what you're getting. And really, when you're uh, looking at the dark field spectrum, um, in this case, of a sample, you're really looking at how much did it affect the lamp spectrum? How did it modify or modulate the lamp spectrum? Well, let's, let's take this apart a little bit. Um, number of things here. First of all, over on the extreme short wavelengths in our system, we have uh, this little notch. The light drops down and to zero. Why does it do that? It's a, it's a light blockage that happens with um, a, a safety filter that's in our liquid light guide to protect it from ultraviolet light. So we really start to see photons illuminating the sample up about, mm, about 420 nanometers, and then it's continuous all the way across. All right, so what about that? What if, what if you wanted to see um, um, spectroscopic activity below 420 nanometers? It's simple. We have another light guide which, which does not have the block in it and it'll carry you down to 400 nanometers. So it's the use of a UV, in that case, a UV ultraviolet liquid light guide. That sets the measurement range a little differently. It'll set it from 400, but up to 750 nanometers instead of 1,000. We call that, that's the blue line here, the blue line uh, the cut off here, around 750. We call that spectrum, here, down, the UV vis spectrum or the UV vis system. When you have the light block in, you have the vis near system. Vis near system is what Byron talked about earlier, and it captures light all the way out past, past visible wavelengths that you can do by eye. Now, the other thing about this is um, in general, the light hitting the sample from underneath is quite intense because of the way we do the uh, dark field uh, illumination. The, the strength of the typical light scattering that you get, pick it up in the, in the objective lens, is much less, it's, it's much less than that. It's down at this level, maybe a tenth or less uh, pers uh, of the uh, illumination strength. So, but most of this light is, is not captured. Most of the Gaussian shape illumination spectrum isn't captured. It goes past at an oblique angle and doesn't get picked up. The other thing that's interesting about this system is the way the, the grading spectrograph works is it actually will produce a second harmonic of the spectrum of the visible light spectrum. The visible light spectrum starts at 420, that means you're going to get another harmonic that can be seen in some cases that starts at, at 460, double the wavelength. So we call this range, this last range out here, let me see if I can get you a pointer here, the spectral range of harmonics. This happens to be seen in certain recording conditions, and it's hardly visible in other recording conditions. All right, so our total spectral range can vary depending on how we set up this, this hyperspectral system. Moving now to 
doing a correction like Byron had shown before, the lamp correction. I have two Gaussian shaped spectrums here. The first one is a gray one. Um, it's slightly shifted to the right here. Um, this has the characteristics of the spectral camera and microscope optics that cause it to come back down again. I also have a spectrum of a sample, which is what we call a spectrally neutral sample. It doesn't cause, uh, it doesn't modify the illumination spectrum itself. It may just attenuate it, but it has the same spectral properties as the lamp. So it produces another Gaussian spectrum here. And this one just slightly shifted over uh, towards blue wavelengths from it. Well, um, as Byron was showing earlier, we did something called lamp correction, where we divided the specimen uh, curve by the lamp curve. And if you, and what we also do is we adjust both of these so they have a peak value at their peaks, they have a value of one. That just makes it easier to do spectral comparisons. When you do the division, you get the orange spectrum, the orange curve across here, which is almost a flat line across. But you see it drops, drops towards long wavelengths because we're underneath the, the uh, lamp spectrum. It rises a little bit above at shorter wavelengths, we increase above the lamp spectrum from the specimen. And it also shows you the light block here. It's present. Um, we don't have to always have this in the displayed spectrum. We can keep that out. So there's uh, this idea of a corrected spectrum. It's if you take what you record directly with hyperspectral push bloom, get a, 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 a a spectral curve off of several pixels from that and divide that by the lamp spectrum directly without adjusting it to one, without adjusting the uh, correcting the peak values, you will get another curve that's called either the reflectance spectrum or transmission spectrum. It's reflectance if light is being reflected back, returned back towards you. It's transmission if the light is going through, as Brian was showing before in most of his, his um, uh, tissue sections, they were transmitted light. In that case, you get a, uh, a, a corrected spectrum, which is a fraction you know, uh, um, of the, um, like reflectance can go from zero to one, for example. Now, when you have all spectral intensities adjusted to equal one at the maximum value, you get something else. It's, it's more useful for comparing shapes of spectra. And you do this quite a lot. We do this, um, and those that was done before in the previous examples too, in the pancreatic um, and, and that mouse tissue. When all the spectral intensities are adjusted equal to one at maximum value, your objective was to compare and you have a number of different samples that were done that way. Your objective then is that you can compare the spectral shapes of each of those samples. Kind of useful to see if you're going to, if you can put those into a uh, spectral filter, uh, a live, uh, a, call it a library filter. Yes. To uh, uh, weed out some of them that that are out of out of. Uh, out of range of what this uh, sample um, has been modified to show. All right, let me move here. I want to show you something that was pretty interesting here. We got this from thin sections. We, we got this. Um, now these are retinal whole mounts. These are hundreds of microns thick. Okay. Um, we're showing the results of taking normal retinal whole mounts from mouse uh, and comparing, those are healthy, comparing them with um, retinal whole mounts from transgenic mice um, that were uh, uh, going to, uh, as they aged, produce amyloid beta 
and produce aggregates, aggregate peptide aggregates of amyloids in the retina. And, and that would be an additional molecular component that's not present in the normal tissue. Um, we did have a uh, nuclear stain in this too, just to, it was DAPI to point out the location of indi individual cells. It turns out that didn't affect anything we were doing with this type of spectroscopy. Um, the work here as uh, it was in that original list that Byron showed earlier, it's given again right here. Uh, this is Dr. Moore and Vince, uh, Center for Drug Drug Design at University of Minnesota. We've got this uh, permission to use to show you. Um, these are hyperspectral images scanned across tissue sections, averaging six sections each. In, um, and these are uncorrected. This is where we haven't done the lamp normalization. You don't need to do it in order to cease, in some cases, the effect of a um, a pathogenic molecule in the sample. Uh, these curves, if you can make it out, you can make it out a little bit better in the lower two. The green curves are the wild type uh, retina. The red curves are from the transgenic Alzheimer's mice, and they contain uh, peptide aggregates of amyloid beta. First of all, I want to show you what we've got again here. This a spectrum. We've got this little cutoff here keeping that. We've got this other area here, which starts at about 860. This is the second harmonic of what we're seeing over here. It's just starts over again. Um, it's not a, uh, it's a correlated event with what's over here. Not necessary to analyze that part. What you do see is instead of a Gaussian shape that you, we saw before for the lamp spectrum, the spectra are now more flat topped in all cases. The flat topping happens because, well, now we've got um, uh, molecular components in that whole mount that absorb and scatter light. We've got, you know, we've got retinal pigment, pigments, melanin, hemoglobin. Uh, we've got a lot of light scattering um, structures in there from, from uh, cellular. Um, um, intracellular components. Those, in each case, you see the flat top. The first case is after two months of, of age and the transgenic mouse, followed in the right upper right panel, six months, and lower left is eight months, and so on and so forth, uh, separating by two months. As the mice, mice aged, we see a change in the transgenic with respect to the wild type. The first two sets of data, they're pretty close to each other. By the time we got down here, eight months, six months, I'm sorry, you see there's a drop off in the light intensity going towards short wavelengths. And that um, continues and maybe is, is, is uh, enhanced over the next few months. What has happened? This is the important amyloid signature that, that we looked at and analyzed. This is the one that, and this is one that you can see without even doing lamp corrections. The, uh, at the Alzheimer's spectral signal is a increasing drop off in the scattered light signal by transmitted dark field or reflective dark field in this case, because we're looking, well, let's see, this is, this is the uh, microscope experiment. Yeah, this is transmitted dark field here um, that drops the intensity that makes it through the uh, tissue mount, uh, the, the thin section. Uh, and um, I'm going to show you why that happens and why we can, we can capture something like this, even though we can't see the particles, can't see the, the um, peptide fragments at all. They're, in, in the, they're solubilized in the extracellular spaces. Why does it happen? Why do we get a drop off towards short wavelengths? Well, this is something that's characteristic of a type of light scatter 
known as Rayleigh scatter. When you have molecules uh, that have a uh, substantially different refractive index than the ex extracellular space, and, you, and they have sizes that are less than a tenth of the optical wavelength that you're using, uh, that you're passing through the tissue, the type of light scatter uh, changes to a regime called Rayleigh scatter. Well, the, the smaller amyloid beta oligomers or, or aggregates uh, and some other pathogenic molecules satisfy this requirement. They'll produce a really, a really uh, there'll be really scattering. What happens, you can see here, if you have a small particle, size is small, the, imagine this is a photon coming in from the left. When they're small, you get a lot of light scattering to the side, and even, even back scattering, and much less forward scattering, as opposed to when you have large particles, just like might be a cell nucleus or some larger intracellular component, you get mostly forward light scattering and very little to the side. Oh, and also this could include over here, the really could include um, like uh, microtubules of of neurons, things that are, are small enough can all do this. The, the, the telltale um, signature of this type of scatter is that the efficiency of that scatter is proportional to one over wavelength to the fourth power. It gets more efficient rapidly as you get to smaller wavelengths. And so if you look over here, this would be a, an efficiency scale uh, plot. Get, it gets more efficient towards smaller wavelengths. It sort of goes up with a power curve. That's a recognizable spectral signature. It's something that can be seen in the presence of other stains, um, especially if those stains uh, don't overlap real strongly with, with the um, shorter wavelengths. But even if they do, um, this still has to occur. So what, what we're going to get with this is a, a concentration of, am, of tissue amyloid beta peptides will be proportional to the strength of the Rayleigh scatter to, to the size of, of this increase. So let's look now. Let's see. So um, let's summarize the way we can do this. We've got these spectral corrections that we're going to try to see amyloid beta with. We've already shown you that you can see it, imply it without any spectral correction, just looking at, at the direct recording. But we can go a little bit better than that. We can do the normalization correction, um, which was done in the pancreatic um, cells earlier. In this case, we just take the sample spectrum and divide it by the lamp spectrum point by point across the spectrum. This uh, ability is, is built into the Cytobiba analysis software. What it'll do is it eliminates the spectral, the instrument's spectral response. So all you have left is a curve that shows you how the, uh, the alien uh, substance or you know, the new substance that's not normal has what its spectral response is. Uh, and when you do this kind of normalization, you'll find that the spectral changes are not proportional to the amyloid concentration changes. And you'll find that the, um, it'll bring, if you have, were to have an increase in amyloids in your, in your sample, it would bring about a negative change to the spectrum. So it's kind of backwards or inverse. There's, there's another way you can do it. Up here, we had spec, sample spectrum divided by lamp spectrum. Well, as long as you have these two together, it doesn't matter which one you divide by. You can put the lamp spectrum on top. You can have an expression like this, lamp spectrum divided by sample spectrum. It'll still correct for the instrument response. If you want something that is um, going to be proportional to the concentration 
of, of the amyloid, then you have to include this log term. And that'll make it act like an absorption spectrum. But, so if we have the logarithm of this inverted ratio, we, we obtain a curve called the optical density, which I'm sure many of you have heard of before. The optical density is what's going to be in the next uh, slide I show you about uh, seeing amyloid in a live mouse. Um, this kind of optical density, uh, it can be done with Envy. It's the math, the math and data collection platform that Cytobiba uses, and they have a spectral mathematics analysis in there that will easily do this. What it does, optical density also eliminates the instrument spectrum response, just like normalization. But the spectral changes now are proportional to amyloid, to the change in amyloid concentration. And now you have it not backwards. An increase in amyloid will bring about a positive change to the spectrum. So you recall back that first slide I showed you, we, we saw a drop off in short wavelengths as amyloid increased. This is going to be the opposite of that drop off. Let's see that. Okay, so now, okay, now we're into a live mouse model. This is, um, this is again a transgenic mouse, um, PSS1, AP, APP1, PS1, I believe. Um, oh, that's close. Here is a, uh, a picture we took with an endoscopic recording system. We had to change the system significantly in order to work with the live case. And we've got six measurement blocks that we're recording from. And we averaged our results from each from all six blocks. Again, what we're doing, this was done by Drs. Moore, myself, and Dr. Pence at Center for Drug Design um, back in 2015. We had um, you know, uh, the um, transgenic mouse, um, these recordings were made at one month intervals. The, mouse is, the mice survived. They just sedated to do this so they can grow and age. Okay. Um, in the beginning, this is using the optical density correction. Does the, uh, do we see a, a optical, do we see an amyloid signature at the first point three months? And the answer is no. It goes straight across uh, over these wavelengths, 400 to uh, about 680 nanometers. If we wait long enough, we start to see an increase in the um, optical density function over time. It goes up. We also see some presence of some other pigments, um, hemoglobin mainly, um, that's, that's of course present in the live system. It's there. Um, what these represent is the difference between normal and Alzheimer's. Normal and Alzheimer's had no difference at three months. And as we went on over time, Alzheimer's started to produce an increase in the number, we think. This is our interpretation of this, an increase in the concentration of amyloid aggregates, peptide aggregates, that cause Rayleigh scattering. The Rayleigh scattering produced sideward scattering of the light. In this case, the light enters this um, live this live ocular fundus, the light actually gets in and, and is scattered multiple times, all directions. It's, it's called an isotropic scattering regime. Um, and, and what you see, what the spectral changes you see have to do with the light that's on its way back to you. So from all of that multiple scattering, there's going to be a, a, some fraction of it that aims back at you and back at the uh, endoscope, okay? And 
that the light that's aimed that way, if there is amyloid present in higher concentrations, there's more side scattering of that light. And so we get an increase in the optical density in, as we look at that kind of um, recording uh, geometry. So here's, here's just showing, yes, we, we can uh, use the, the pixel by pixel spectroscopy available from hyperspectral imaging to look at a place where you're not going to see individual amyloid aggregates, which are under the image resolution, under the a contrast. We don't have a contrast sensitivity in the system to see them, but we can see them by virtue of really light scatter. I've just broken this bottom panel, I've just broken it down to show the components which are um, really scatter and um, the hemoglobin absorption. Let me show you that in, when we switched over from mice to humans. Let me get my phone off here because right now we're just... Sorry about that. When we've got, uh, when we looked in uh, about 16 normal and 12, uh, or 12 normal and 16, um, diagnosed Alzheimer's subjects from age 60 to about 85. And we kept track of their scores, their, their cognition scores with the MMSE score, mini mental status uh, evaluation. We found this increase in the optical density curve for those which had high scores. They had minimal cognitive decline. We saw this thing uh, then start to come back to be like a normal or even more, more, more. Uh, it, it didn't portray small amyloid aggregates anymore because they probably have turned into black deposits at this point. So the really scattering, it was able to say, well, here we are at a certain point in the cognitive decline of subjects, but we still have a lot of solubilized amyloid in the tissue, small enough to do Rayleigh scattering. And apparently it's, it's toxic enough at that point uh, to, to start to uh, bring on mild cognitive decline. Okay, that was interesting too. Here are the scores going down to 20 and 16. 26 is considered very good. 16 is, is, is severe. And you can see that the amount of really light scattering follows the severity. The, uh, uh, follow, uh, the amount of really light scattering follows the um, mildness of the, of the um, cognitive decline. Those were the interesting things we saw. Couldn't see the, um, the objects, see the form of the objects at all. We just did, um, relied on the spectroscopy. The point here is that molecular pathogens within tissue sections, they do have recognizable spectral signatures. Um, even if they're not present as distinct forms, they're below the limit of resolution. They don't have a lot of contrast. They don't have dyes on them, labels on them. They have enough contrast to scatter light. You can get it identified. Uh, they can be identified by the spectroscopy. Uh, it's, it's helpful to do this with hyperspectral imaging because in that case, uh, you can develop a relationship between these spectral changes and other aspects of the tissue morphology at the same time. And we showed, I think, that the changes have a, quantit a quantitative interpretation. That's all I really had um, about uh, hyperspectral uh, detection of early Alzheimer's and the path leading up to that with hyperspectral imaging. I'll turn it back to Byron to see what we do. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for the, the, the we wanted to provide a deep dive in, into real work that was done from a, from a pathology perspective, looking at disease diagnostics 
uh, and and it, it, it's in a white space. It's in an area where there, there's a tremendous need, and and, uh, and so uh, you know the, the group at University of Minnesota, along with Dr. Beach, uh, led that effort, and and it's continuing on now with a third party. Uh, in, in additional clinical trials, as we understand. We want to transition now, and I know, Carol, there were a couple of, of questions that, that, uh, that, that, that have been posed. Carol, if, if, if you wouldn't mind, please, uh, if you would read the questions and, and uh, we'll answer. And uh, if there are none, then we can, uh, we can uh, uh, you know, in, in the webinar. Sure, Byron. Um, so there was actually um, a comment and then a question. So the comment was um, thanking us for kind of, I guess, going through the explanation of um, dark field and hyperspectral imaging and, um, you know, a deep dive that you and Jim both went through. Um, the second one um, is also from the same person. And um, they had a little bit of um, info. Um, they said, I agree that Cytoviva HSI system is a very powerful tool for analysis um, with nanoparticles. It's very helpful to research in bioimaging and nano safety teams in, uh, at CRIS, K-R-I-S-S, -S, where I think they have a system. So this person has three questions. First question, nowadays, the most interesting nanoparticles have hyperspectral features in the 340 nanometer to 500 nanometer range. However, our side of Eva HSI system has a noisy signal between the 400 nanometers to 470. How do they solve this problem? Well, I, one, of the, one of the easiest ways to do that, uh, we, we'd mentioned that uh, there are different detectors that have come out and it might be that uh, Utilizing uh, uh, an SCMOS detector, for example, instead of a, instead of the uh, old CCD, would produce more quantum efficiency in that range. But also potentially modifying the light source for more excitation in the UV range, uh, as well as, of course, using proper uh, light guides, as Jim mentioned, the UV vis versus the vis near, for example. Those are all things that would potentially produce. Uh, a better uh, spectral recording in that wavelength range from 400 out to about one. Yes, uh, there is enough light even from a halogen um, to get you just under through, under 400 nanometers if that light is allowed to make it through the light guide. Um, and you can you can actually uh, record with with the um, standard. Um, spectrograph, imaging spectrograph that's in our system, you can record um, spectral curves that go down to about 380. They're there. Uh, depends on getting the life through it. So, but, but yes, those, those um, components um, can be, bump, can be um, interchanged a little bit to give you more enhanced um, visible uh, spectroscopy. And, and then you may um, lose a little bit on the near infrared at the same time. Okay, thank you. All right, so that was it in terms of questions, Carol? Well, there's two more. Oh, two more, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. Yeah, he, this is a three-part question. Okay, all right, okay. <laughs> um, secondly, um, when they take the 3D tissue, they usually use um, Z stacking for 3D convolution method. In this way, is the condenser also shifted the Z position for correct dark field imaging. So read, read the question one more time, the last part. Yeah. Um, usually use Z stacking for 3D deconvolution method. Yes. In this way, is the condenser also shifted Z position for correct dark field imaging? So um, only, if, only if you're covering a very large volume area in the z-axis would you need to refocus the dark field condenser um, and in and, 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 and typical you know 10 20 micron thick sections that wouldn't be necessary to do if you were in you know multiple hundred micron sections you would probably need to adjust the dark field condenser as part of that process okay awesome and Third, uh, it's actually kind of a question comment. We want to buy the um, enhanced dark field condenser only um, because I think 
okay. the exit pupil pelt. So we will be in touch. <laughs> right, right. No, no, absolutely. Yeah. So we can sell, uh, you know, if you had an, if you had a bright field microscope and you wanted to add uh, uh, hyperspectral mic uh, imaging to it, we can do that. Uh, we can add dark field components to an existing microscope if, if you need to do that. Uh, and, and so we can have those discussions more on a one-on-one -on -one basis. We, we were here today to really just provide an overview of the technology. Uh, we're not going to try to, to uh, be very commercial today with regard to that. But if you have questions about configurations and things that might work relative to your research applications uh, or clinical applications, you can contact us at the info at cytoviva.com and, and we'd be pleased to, uh, to work with you on that. Thank you, Byron. Um, that's, that's, it. that's all. Okay. Well, thank everyone very much for attending today. Uh, we will, uh, we will uh, end the webinar now and look forward to hearing from anyone that has additional questions going forward. Thank you.